I'm Catherine Witte. I'm your conference secretary to Global Ministries, and my home church is that we're our first. I actually live in Denver, really close to the airport, which mm -hmm. has worked out really well. <laughs> and uh, Christian joins us. He's a, a Chilean, Chilean young man who is currently serving in Mexico City. And he is an attorney by trade, but he has lots of fascinating stories. He's been many places, and I know that he is going to bless you tonight with his ministry. So, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Church, for having me over today. Thank you for to Scott that actually make this possible. Thank you all for being uh, so welcoming tonight. So, my name is Christian Schlick. Uh, I'm the Regional Migration Specialist with the with AMCOR, with the Global Migration Team of AMCOR. I'm a missionary with the United Methodist Church, and I currently live in Mexico City. Uh, so actually, uh, I come from Chile. I grew up and I was born in a place called Iquique, Chile. I'm an attorney by profession, but I also, uh, years ago, I decided to go into candidacy process, so I was a lay pastor. You would call it here a certificate lay minister. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there, you can see my pictures there a long time ago. It's looked like another life <laughs> <laughs> when I used to uh, do this pastoral work. Uh, but in 2017, I was invited to become a missionary. And that's how I moved from the South to Central America. In 2017, I started first as a Global Mission Fellow and then as a Global uh, Missionary. And I was assigned first to live in El Salvador, where I lived for three years. Then I moved to Honduras, to Tegucigalpa, where I lived for a few months. And during COVID, I moved to Mexico, where actually I live and serve today. I really like this picture. It was taken last year on Cartagena de Indias, Colombia. Uh, the Colombian Methodist Church ran one of the partners' projects with us, which is a program for refugee children, mostly Venezuelans, that have escaped the country and have settled in Colombia. Mm. And this is the program. We were over there, and actually they invited us to participate in the baptism of the children. Mm. So they invited me to do the benediction by the end, mm -hmm. and somebody took that really good picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe it's a really good picture because it actually shows what mission is for us in the United Methodist Church. It's never about us, it's about the people. Mm. I really like this picture because it shows the kids. It doesn't show actually my face. I know that that's not good for communication. <laughs> but it represents what mission and we, what we as missionaries are called to do. To be with people, uh, whatever they are. Uh, supporting their needs and their community. It's never about us, but it's about people and it's about God. So I'm a missionary with AMCOR. I'm going to skip this because I'm pretty sure you all know what AMCOR is. You're familiar with AMCOR. But I like this quote from Bishop Herbert from 1940 that says that AMCOR serve as a voice of conscience among Methodists to act in the relief of human suffering without distinction of race, color, or creed. I don't know if you are familiar with Angkor's story, but on the 40s, one of the main words of Angkor actually was to help refugees that escaped from World War II and were coming into the U.S. Mm -hmm. So a few years ago, uh, Angkor again put it, uh, a special place to migrant ministries into the office, and that's how the Global Migration Team, which I'm part of it, uh, it have been created in Angkor. So we're really small, team, as you can see, the team over there is just five people. <laughs> you see Soila, who is the general um, program manager for all of AMCOR's programs. Uh, the Reverend Jack Amick is the um, director of Global Migration and Special Assignments. My colleague, Daniel Valcazar, is the manager that actually runs all the grants process that we have as AMCOR. You can see me and my colleague, Joe Eva, who is the other regional migration specialist based in Geneva. She, she covers uh, Europe as a, an area, and I cover all, all of the Latin American and the Caribbean. Oh so we're talking about more than 22 countries to cover. So what the Global Migration Team does is uh, encourage, support, and equip Methodists and ecumenical partners for migrant ministries. It provides relief and recovery in the form of food, aid, basic necessities, and legal and transportation services for vulnerable migrants. And it's global because we are actually all over the globe. It's not focused in the U.S., 
but it's focused on the migration reality that is happening in the five continents. Mm. <clears throat> it's not really clear, but uh, the UMC years ago, in one of the general conference, passed this resolution that recognized that all migrants have four rights, from our perspective. Mm. First is the right to stay. We believe as Methodists that nobody should be forced to flee their home country their home communities. So we ensure it's for communities to be sustainable, for people to remain in their community if that was they want. And nobody should be forced to leave their home community. Second is the right to safe passage, <clears throat> because the reality is that most of migration movements around the globe are not safe for migrants. I live in Mexico, so I have to deal with the reality in Mexico, which a lot of migrants cross, but it's extremely dangerous and have many threats for their life and their dignity. Mm -hmm. The right to welcome, like when they arrive to their final destination, they should be welcome in this coaching community and be integrated and be part of those communities. And the right to return with dignity. Because we also work with the reality of people returning to their country, but mostly being deported back to mm -hmm. countries and communities that have never been part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's the reality we work with as Amcor. <clears throat> I really like this graphic wow. <laughs> that shows you how actually migrations around the world is happening. Yeah. This is from two years ago, we need to update it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a really good, so you have blue points and, green and red points. So as you can see, most of the migration is not happening in this continent and it's not happening in the US. It's happening in other places of the world. Mm -hmm. um, being Turkey, uh, old Turkey, <laughs> they changed the name last year. Um, yeah. One of the main, uh, one of the biggest countries that actually hosts refugees. They have hosted in the last year a million people from Syria, uh, 500 people from Afghanistan, just in the recent year. So actually, Turkey today is one of the biggest hosting country. But the U.S. and Canada continue to be important point of destination, especially for people in Central America and the Caribbean. But as you can see, like in South America like my home country, Argentina, Brazil, they're also receiving a lot of, Uruguay are also receiving a lot of uh, migrants, especially from Central America and from Venezuela and Colombia. So that gives you a perspective why we are a global team. Because the needs of migration are located all over the place, and that's why we have someone in Europe and we have someone in Latin America and the Caribbean to work with our partners. So. What is my work about? <laughs> what do we do as regional migration specialists? So first, getting closer contact with grantees and potential grantees because AMCOR provides grants to partners in the field mm -hmm. that are already doing the work and we support their work through grants. Uh, better awareness of the missionary work being done with migrants, increased understanding of migration policies, practices and flows. It's really hard to do this part <laughs> yeah. because policies keep changing. Right. And in my case, that I covered more than 22 countries, it means that I have to keep update with policies in 22 countries. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, challenging. <laughs> uh, networking and learning from regional conversations, because we are part of many um, networks that help us to understand what is happening on the field and how we can be more efficient in the way that we support our partners. Uh, this is a picture from actually one of the refugee crises a few years in Europe, it's not from North America. But it helped us to remind that welcoming is what the church does. We as communities of faith are called, based on our, uh, in our Christian understanding, to be welcome communities for every single human being because we believe that everyone is God creation. Mm -hmm. So respect, they deserve respect and their dignity needs to be uplift. Mm -hmm. So in our case, we focus on uplifting human dignity for migrant people. The core humanitarian standards are an international rule, set of rules that helps to everybody that works in humanitarian field about how to provide uh, good services for people. So we as AMCOR base our work, our humanitarian work in this core humanitarian standard. Mm -hmm. A really old, they're being updated. In the beginning, it was like six pages. Today, it's a blue <laughs> and a big <laughs> book because they keep adding things. But actually, are those rules that we use as AMCOR, but we also promote to our partners to use in the field 
because our rules, um, not rules, but uh, ideas and maybe guidelines of how to do the work in a way that you're actually uplifting people's dignity and not mistreating them when you want to provide a support. Like simple, simple things that maybe you are familiar with, like it's really common for people to donate clothes for the people in need. So one of these standards tell you don't donate things that actually you were thinking to send it to the trash. Right. <laughs> like we don't like don't send to to the food bank or uh, waste food. Uh, like don't don't send clothes that you will never wear. Actually, so how we can be aware that uh, having a good heart to support communities in need, it does it has to be uh, remembered that we are working with human beings. Mm -hmm. And actually, in our Christian perspective, there is God creations, so we need to remember that. And that's what the core humanitarian standards do. So here are some of the partners that we have from the last three years. As you can see, most of them are the local Methodist churches in South America, but also other ecumenical uh, institutions like CAREF in Argentina um, was created 50 years ago. I'm going to be next month in their 50 anniversary in Buenos Aires um, and they basically provide legal services for migrants that travel to Argentina and stay there. The same with FASIC in my home country Chile. They also provide legal services for, for people that want to stay there and when they arrive they take all this process. In Central America, which have a special place in my heart, we, we work with Methodist and ecumenical partners, the Lutheran, the Anglicans, uh, with different uh, kind of ministries that are focused on mostly people that um, are leaving the country or need shelters. Uh, we work with the Jesuit, with the Catholics, with the Lutheran assignment. So it's an ecumenical approach based on uh, faith-based communities, no matter what their faith-based community actually is, but who are actually doing the work in the field of supporting the partners. And in Mexico, where I live now, uh, we have a lot of partners. Uh, the Methodist Church of Mexico is one of the mains, um, but we have a, a really diverse uh, portfolio of partners in Mexico that are doing different work. Uh, I love this, Sin Fronteras, <laughs> because I'm a lawyer, uh, and there are also lawyers, and actually they provide legal services mm -hmm. in Mexico for all the migrants that stay in Mexico. Uh, I will give you some information about that. And this is other recent programs. And we are also partnering with some networks like uh, Act Alliance and the campaign Como Nacido Entre Nosotros. <clears throat> and that actually are networks of churches and organizations in the field that coordinate the work. So uh, I'm part of those uh, networks as well in a way to be part of what's going on, to learn and also help us to identify partners in what their, their need actually are. Uh, AMCOR grants try to fill gaps. So we support partners that are already doing the work and we try to come with a small grant uh, based on, and, and <laughs> it's not a small, <laughs> but it's a small based on the amazing work they do uh, to support actually what they're doing. I wanted to share this, it's in Spanish sadly, but <clears throat> this is the information from the Migration Office of Mexico for September of this year. If you see this number, they have processed this year over 37,000 applications oh of people from Haiti that actually stayed in Mexico until September. Wow. And you can see that Honduras, Cuba, Salvador, Venezuela are the main groups that actually, uh, it's people that uh, have done all the migrant routes, but they don't come to the state that state, uh, they stay in Mexico. So, so far, Mexico just this year already have 112,000 refugees. Wow. And that means this is people that already have recognized their status. Doesn't mean how many applications more they have in the waiting list. Mm. But that gives you a perspective about why we have a global approach and why it is important to have also this word present, not just in the US side, but also in the Mexican side and all over the Americas. I love this, this picture as well. <laughs> was taken uh, just before coming to the States. Uh, and we were visiting a partner in Tijuana. Uh, she's the director of Center 32. Uh, 32 is the parallel where Tijuana is located. 
and they are a center that provides services to different shelters in the city and we have been partnered with them through grants. We were visiting uh, what they're doing and actually uh, I think represent most of all of the work we do because uh, you see a small river here, a mm. creek, that is gray, gray waters. Mm. We are wearing masks not because of COVID mm -hmm. but because of the lack of hygiene in the area. But uh, it actually shows us the level of commitment of Amcor partners in the field, what they're doing, that they actually have a shelter that you cannot see in the picture in the back. But that shows you the level of commitment that these people that is willing to cross every single day gray waters to go actually where the people is and where the needs is. Mm -hmm. um, so when you support Amcor work, when you support us as missionaries, you are actually supporting people like this. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the mission field, but honestly, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing this job every <laughs> single day. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't as well. <laughs> but uh, partnering with Amcor work and partnering with missionaries is a really good way for you to actually support what the people in the field is doing. Mm. Uh, to be engaged in mission, and being able that your resources actually goes to the people that actually need it. Mm -hmm. And my work as a regional migration specialist is to make sure of that, that our partners are, are really doing the work they say they're doing and how we can be more efficient in helping them and supporting them work in the field. In the beginning, I used to do field uh, work. I, I, uh, for three years, I was taking refugee cases, helping people to leave Central America, as refugee to many other places of the world. Today I was working, I was talking with somebody and they asked me how many came to the States and I was remembering that in my cases in three years, nobody came to the States. Wow. They all went to other places. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is that people that actually migrate prefer to go to community where they're all, they already have a family or a relative mm -hmm. that could help them to start a new life. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can choose, they will choose to go to those destinations. They wouldn't prefer to go to some place where they don't know the language, where they don't know anybody, and means to start from zero, from scratch. So, so it was really good. And also, I love it because this is the Amcor approach of work. We are there to help people. We don't tell them what to do. They tell us what we need, what they need, and we try to partner with them because we don't have the answers. People in the field knows what they actually need and what the answers are for their challenges and the situation of the people in the field. So that, I, I love this picture, it was a casual picture, <laughs> somebody took it, and then we thought it's a really good picture actually. <laughs> <laughs> actually represent what, what the core values of Angkor are. Uh, so this is another project we were visiting in Mexico, the Methodist Church of Mexico in Tijuana runs a, a feeding program. They feed people, migrants and people on, on the streets every afternoon and they are located just in front of the border, cross point, called El Chaparral, which is one of them. You have seen it, you, maybe you have never heard the name, but you have seen it in the news. <laughs> because the, all the camps and all the people waiting on the wall was that area. So the Methodist Church built this, uh, this feeding program, they call it El Comedor, which is called, you would translate it as a dinner place. And they provide dinners to, to migrants that are waiting and also for people in, that are living on the street. This is other kind of projects that we partner with. Uh, this is also a recent picture from the Dominican Republic a few weeks ago. And I love this uh, project because we just supported them with an emergency grant for the situation in the Dominican Republic with people of Haiti. But this is a program just for women and children. Uh, one of our main partners in the Dominican Republic, which is the social service of churches, um, they run this project where women of low-income communities, mostly of the migrants from Haiti, uh, participate on this uh, planting coffee beans, and they grow them to a certain level, and then they sell it to the coffee farmers. They cannot produce coffee because they don't have land to actually plant and produce the coffee. But they participate in the, uh, in the economy network uh, planting those plants and with this money they they provide the means for the family mm -hmm. so this is another example of what our partners are doing what the Amcor money that means your money <laughs> is doing in the field mm -hmm. 
and how we are supporting people and how we are equipping, equipping people. Mm -hmm. And I love this project because when I was visiting them, actually it happens that the Dominican Republic shut the border with Haiti. You know that Haiti and Dominican Republic are the same island. Mm -hmm. And all of the men left mm -hmm. and left all the women and their children behind. Mm -hmm. So that was the main reason why we decided to send them an emergency grant to them because uh, you have all these women with their children now without even uh, without having any way to support them. Um, through this program, all of the women that are part of this program, they have also a small gardens in their houses mm -hmm. where they produce local food for eating for themselves or even to bring them to the markets and sell it as another way to get uh, money for, for, for supporting their families. And, and yes, this is what AMCOR actually is doing in places like the Dominican Republic. Well, our partners are doing and we are partnering with our partners through this grant and through this technical support and assistance in what they need. This is another picture I was taking, <laughs> but actually shows what my looks like, looks like <laughs> in the last year. <laughs> um, this guy is a guy from Haiti that runs a school for Haitian uh, kids. In the Dominican Republic happened something unique. Seven years ago, no, 10 years ago, the Supreme Court decided that following actually the law on the Dominican Republic, that the children of Haitian women were not Dominican Republic citizens. Mm -hmm. That means that in the Dominican Republic, we have more than 10,000 people who are actually stateless persons. Mm -hmm. Because in the Dominican Republic, the law says that if you are born from a Dominican woman in the Dominican Republic, you have the citizenship. If it's not, even if the father is from the Dominican Republic, they don't have papers. Mm -hmm. So they have this situation where for the last 10 years, you have more than 10,000 people without papers, without going back. They, they were born in the Dominican Republic, but they are not considered Dominicans. They cannot go to Haiti because Haiti don't recognize them. Uh, people from Haiti, and they cannot leave the island to any other country because they don't have passports. Yeah. They don't have IDs. They are st stateless people. Mm -hmm. So that is a beautiful project I also like because what they did is to support education to elementary and pre-K -pre level for people from Haiti in their communities in a way to keep them track, uh, to, su to support their education because for a long time families were too afraid of persecution, so they wouldn't send their kids to the school because they could be uh, targeted and registered. So, so, so this is a beautiful project. And my work actually is to be there with them, uh, to listen to what they need and find ways to partner. And in some cases, even bring other people to the table that can actually support what they're doing because we cannot support all the work they, that they are doing. But sometimes we can connect people with other people to actually can support them. So that's what my work looks like in the last uh, month. So how can you get involved in global migration work? The first one is this uh, Mustard Seed Migration Grants. It's a small grant that it started last year. It's for United Methodist congregation in the US and all over the place that are interested in knowing the local community and engaging with the migrant community in the local area. It's a small grant of two, just $2,000, but it's aimed to invite you to see how can you do uh, a special uh, activity or, or, or event that helps you to engage with the migrant community. It's nothing to get, uh, to get engaged in great levels, but to do something small and significant for the migrant community. For example, last year, one of the projects was from one of the churches was just buying backpacks and the school supplies uh, to give to Guatemalan kids. Mm -hmm. In other case, another church decided to support an Afghan family that needed support to pay the rent of the house for the first month. So they used this 2000 to find a place to live, to pay the first month of rent and kind of furnish the house. So we are inviting all the local United Methodist co connection all over the globe to be creative. If you're interested, in knowing what's actually happening around you, and if you have migrants in your area, how can you 
uh, connect with them and learn from them, learn what they're doing, and the Master Seed Grant is a really good opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a small, but it can be really significant for the people that you are actually uh, getting in connection with. Supporting missionaries. <laughs> 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 and I'm here. Uh, as you know, we as missionaries of the United Methodist Church, we are sent, we are sent from everywhere to everywhere. Mm -hmm. And our work is only possible because people like you is actually willing to engage in mission. We call it in mission together. Mm -hmm. uh, the missionaries are covered by the generous gift that the churches and individual members all over the globe are do actually are, are putting into the advance. Here you have my advance number. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in making a donation, you can go online or through the church treasury. You can send a check to GF. FCA and, and they will make manage all the situation and it's really important because when you are supporting one missionary you're actually supporting all the missionaries today we are more than 300 missionaries in the field around the world and and when you support one of us you're actually supporting all the connection of missionaries because we cover each other and also if you are interested in supporting more and deep and deeper and have a deepest connection with the global migration work that Amcor is doing around the world the global migration team actually have a special advance number mm. that is different than the general AMCOR fund. And, and you are invited to, if you are interested in, in, in also donating to this special fund, uh, I would highly appreciate it because when you donate money to this fund, mm -hmm. it, it, it's allowed me to develop my programs. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's another advance number and, and we are kind to promote it because it's, it has become really challenging to do our work because um, we haven't received that many donations to the advance. Uh, last year, for example, just to give you numbers, uh, we, we gave a million dollar in 12 month grants all over the world. But we just, le we just fundraised $150,000. <laughs> So that gives you a perspective of how behind we are in our budget, in our, in our fundraising. So you're welcome to, uh, if you're interested, uh, to engage with the Global Migration Team uh, through me as a missionary, but also if you're interested through the Global Migration Advance Number, who is the one that actually allows us to do the work in the field. So I don't want to bother you anymore, but I'm open for all of your questions that you may have and gladly answer. Scott, where, where, where did the rest of that million dollars come from? From the general funds of GVGM <coughs> and Amcor. The general secretary decided to <coughs> cover that because we believe that the migration work is really important. So from the general funds that are available, he put it there, the rest of the money. Hmm. This is a question for all of us, Rebecca. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> has, has anyone recorded the advance numbers? Martha has already set up a donation on Breeze. So you, she so did it ahead three, of time. All, all of them are for the digital global. I think she did Christians' yes. uh, individual advance number. Okay, good. So okay. if you want to do the other ones, okay. you'll get all those right, numbers. Thank you. So I ask that too. we can we'll add them. And I also photograph them. So. Yeah, but uh, just just to give just to give you just to give you idea, like uh, some churches that we already partners, there will take at some point of the year some special donation just for this advance in one of the special Sundays. Mm -hmm. So you can consider to do that if you're interested in donating money to the Global Migration Advance. I'm telling you because what other churches already told me. <laughs> <laughs> what What's the major way that people who need help in these countries? know that all these agencies exist to provide help. I mean, how, how do you publicize there? Uh, each the spot, country, each country have their own unique context. Okay. So it's totally different. For example, CAREF in Argentina is the it's a ecumenical uh, agency that is started 50 years ago by Methodists, Mennonites, Episcopalian, Lutherans, okay. Okay. Disciples of Christ, and all the Protestant churches. So everybody in Argentina goes to CAREF when they need support. FASIC in Chile, something similar, it started helping people when we have suffered a dictatorship to leave the country and then continue to help people to, to, to help them. So a really well-known and renowned institution in their country, in the case of Mexico, which is different, uh, the Red Cross actually provide a map to migrants where the, all these projects are located. Many of the projects we partner with, like the Methodist shelters, 
uh, Apaxco and in Tijuana, they are in this map. So people that are migrating through Mexico, through the Red Cross, know where to go. Okay. So, and they know what kind of services they will provide. For example, in Tijuana, the project that I show you just provide meals, dinners. Yeah. But there is another project in Mexico City, in the north, in Apaxco. Uh, I think the symbol is here. It's called uh, Un Oasis, that means oasis in the middle of the room. And is the, that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, and what they do is a shelter. That is, I, I, I don't know if you ever heard about the beast, the train, La Bestia, the beast. Yes. It has some documentary and everything. The Methodist Church owned a property, an old temple, just next to one of the cement uh, uh, industry where the beast stopped to get cement to bring to the, to the U.S. So a lot of migrants go there when the train stops and it's being loaded waiting to get into the train when the train continues. So the Methodist Church created a shelter there that provide night, uh, <coughs> they, they only work in the morning and the night because most of the people that arrive to that destination, actually what they want is to jump into the train. Mm -hmm. So what the Methodists are doing there is providing breakfast, dinner, mm -hmm. hot showers, uh, telephone service for them to communicate with the relatives, wherever they are, mm -hmm. uh, health, Health, uh, health uh, services, mm -hmm. like emergency services mostly, and, and bed for them to sleep in the night in a safe area because it's really dangerous for them to sleep outside because of the police, because of the organized mm -hmm. crime in the area. So that's give you an example, of, yeah. depending on each country, how we, how we mm -hmm. promote. And I would just add, justice for your neighbors up there. Yes. Um, to give you kind of a regional U.S. example, I, I'm familiar with the Justice for Your Neighbors, mm -hmm. for our neighbors in Omaha, Nebraska, that do a lot of similar immigration work, yes. where they have a church and community worker who is um, on staff, and they do um, partner with other Omaha agencies, so they identify the migrants who may need a legal counsel or legal help, and they have clinics that then help people fill out the yes. forms, okay. help avoid getting taken by people who are just out to get their money, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And I think that's done regionally around the U.S. as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's an example of it more, you know, closer just, to us on the ground. Yeah, yeah. justice of our neighbor. Sure justice for our neighbor is, is actually a, a, the Methodist group, the Methodist institution that in the U.S. providing legal clinics for migrants. It's located in different uh, parts, in different states, they're really big in Mexico, in New Mexico, in California, in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're like really big in those areas because it's like where more people are actually asking for those services. But they have offices and liaisons in almost every single state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like if you have cases or people that need support, justice for neighbors, always have. And it's a Methodist mm -hmm. connection. <laughs> and they have done some work in the Mexican side of the border, that's why. I was wondering about that particular group with the influx of migrants that Denver is currently receiving from uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if Justice for a Neighbor actually is doing something here. We know that there are some other ecumenical and Methodist uh, work that actually are doing, like for example, today I was in Breckenridge and they have uh, Dreamers, uh, which is actually run by the Methodists over there with other churches and they are provided. Uh, services actually they hosted a few months ago Nicaraguan's pol political refugees. I don't know if you're aware of the situation in Nicaragua. The government has become a dictatorship and they send a lot of people into the U.S. because of the U.S. agreement to free the political prisoner. Oh, yeah. And when they arrive to the U.S., they, they, they become a, st a stateless person. They cancel the citizenship. So they cannot go back to Nicaragua. Oh, wow. And the Methodist Church in Breckenridge uh, with the with the support of this local organization called Dreamers, uh, because they used to work with Dreamers, uh, hosted three political prisoners from Nicaragua. So that's give you an example of what Methodist Connection is doing here in Colorado. And also the the, the annual conference also have a Hispanic a ministry, and they also work with that. So maybe Catherine can get you more information about what the, this annual conference is doing here in the area. You and you, <laughs> sorry. I'd like to know how many languages do you speak, and do you feel like when you look back on your life, how is God? How did God prepare you to become a missionary to do all of this? Oh, what a journey you must have been on. Languages I speak uh, a little Spanish, English, and Portuguese, 
I speak a little bit Italian, I understand French and I speak German and Latin because I learned it at the <laughs> university. Uh, 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 I study law because I come from a family that uh, encouraged me to study something traditional, we call it. Uh, my sister is also a lawyer, uh, so that gives you like a family business. Um, but I felt the call from God to be in mission, to serve, so that's why I thought at some point to become a pastor. I did that, I really enjoyed it, but then realized that being a missionary actually offered me the opportunity to put my two trainings and passion together, social justice and this pastoral side as well, in the service of the community. So uh, I'm really glad that somebody actually thought and invited me to become a missionary years ago because I'm actually doing what I think I know in some house to do it. Uh, and to put like my experience, my practice in the service of the community because I grew up uh, in a church where we, we were taught that uh, being in community and working through uh, social justice is actually our duty as Christians and is part of our Christian faith Amen. to do this, this social holiness. I'm really Methodist, I'm being Methodist all my life. So, uh, what actually uh, social holiness looks like. And I believe that missionary, uh, being a missionary actually provide me that opportunity uh, to put uh, would maybe God prepare me to, to take me into this road without even me knowing yes. where I was doing it. So mm. I've been really blessed and I'm really glad that actually I can do this uh, on behalf of the church as well. Sorry. Well, this may be too big a question and too much outside the scope of your work, which seems to be helping migrants where they are. But if you had the chance to have a half hour audience with the President of the United States, <laughs> Or the Speaker of the House. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> if if you like, can find one. Or, or is there one thing you would most want to tell this person about crafting policy to, to help? Really good, interesting. Uh, I always remember this morning, I uh, usually don't promote myself because, as I tell you, I believe that mission is about people and not about us. But on 2019, I was invited to the U.S. Congress and I actually uh, participated as an expert witness in the Tom Lanton's Human Rights Commission of the House of Representatives <laughs> oh. uh, to advocate in favor of TPS holder of El Salvador. So I've been able to tell the representative in Congress what they're doing. I was, ex uh, I was living in El Salvador and actually it was my, Christmas, it was my birthday. I was in the U.S. Congress uh, uh, testifying to oh. this commission in Congress um, doing advocacy for people from Central America that are living here. Uh, uh, so, so I, I can tell you what, from a technical perspective, it's necessary to do, but the political decisions are, are, are away from our hands. <laughs> you, I, I believe that you need to elect a representative that actually thinks uh, about what is best for the communities wow. <laughs> and not for the local party. Uh, what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> I invite you to no, think I'm about that the next that. time you go to the polls. <laughs> but right now, uh, this current administration have taken a few policies that are actually working in, in the border. Um, in the beginning, the, the, the approach to the situation in the Mexico-US border was not the best and people felt really uh, mistreated. And, but currently, uh, the current administration created this program CVP-1, which is a, a application system that helps to process all the applicants that are waiting in the border. Mm, it has its failure, but I believe it's a really good example of when the politician, the government wants to do something to fix the problem, they can do it. Um, in the beginning, this application, CVP1, which is a cellular app where you do all your applications uh, to request to come into the state, um, had a lot of challenges. <laughs> Let me tell you one that is really famous over there. They wouldn't recognize black people. Hmm. You have to do all this and you have to take a picture. And in the beginning, the algorithm wouldn't recognize black people. Okay. Wow. So that can give you an example of a structural racism yeah. in the algorithm. <laughs> uh, people in the field advocated to fix that and they fixed it after a month. In the beginning, it was really traumatizing for people, especially from Haiti living there, yeah. because the app would tell you, like, we needed a human face. Oh. So imagine someone getting into this camera and tell them like bring a human <laughs> so so it was oh really God. really and and what the people in the field did in the beginning was just putting all this light on people's faces so the application could actually recognize that there was a human face in front oh. mm -hmm. now that is fixed mm. 
<coughs> but now the problem is that the government says that they don't have enough resources to actually process all the application through this app. And they created the re this restriction where uh, a certain amount of application can be processed in one cell phone. And that brings you to the problem that to apply, you needed a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And, you are, and we're talking about people that has nothing. Right. So, but they request a smartphone from them. So the people in the border, most of our partners and other organizations provide those smartphones for people to apply from the shelters. Oh. But now then they created a limit of application that you can do by phone. Oh. So there you have an example of a good idea, of a good policy, but at the same time, because of all the political things going around, they created blocks in the, in the, in the policy and the system that actually make things slower. Mm -hmm. People, uh, uh, when I was in Tijuana, uh, migrants and partners were telling me like, they say that they cannot process enough applications, but that is a lie. Because when the Ukrainian were here, uh -huh. they processed them all in three days. Mm. And then leave in, and even let them cross with their pet. Oh. Mm. And oh. it's the reality that a lot of families, especially with small kids, when they get there in a way to help their kids to, uh, to go through the trauma that actually they suffer through the roots, they have pets. But they are not allowed to bring their pets into the U.S. Mm. Mm. But people from Ukraine, they cross with their pets. Mm -hmm. So that gives you also a perspective mm -hmm. about there's some political reasons right. that are bigger that when, they are, when there is a genuine interest in, in solving the, the situation, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I don't know if it helps very, you. Very good answer. Very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. So yes. But I do believe that the CVP, CVP uh, one program that we have now is a really good tool. Uh, it would be better if they don't limit the, the, the amount of application that you can do by a smartphone <laughs> mm -hmm. because that creates the, the reality that it's people that have nothing. That's why they are in shelters, mm -hmm. <laughs> asking for food and a place to sleep. So mm -hmm. why a smartphone? <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. it's kind of like these contradictions in the system. Mm -hmm. So you got an opportunity to testify and share your um, experience. Is there within the UMCOR organization, a branch that specifically works on policy to complement the on-the-ground work? No. When I did that, I was invited as a person and not as an UMCOR representative mm -hmm. because UMCOR uh, does not do advocacy work. We focus on humanitarian assistance, <coughs> but the UMC has a general agency called Church and Society. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Church and Society is the agency of the United Methodist Church that actually does the work of advocacy. Okay. They are located in Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. Their building is just next to the Supreme Court. Okay. It's the oldest building in the area. <laughs> it's belonged to the United Methodist Church and shares spaces with many other advocacy agencies. But uh, if you're interested in advocacy for policy here, mm -hmm. go to church, serve, uh, church and Society and they will tell you how to do <laughs> advocacy on the Congress, in your state uh, area, or whatever you are needed. Because the church has an agency for that. But Amcor, we focus on humanitarian relief for people in need. Yeah, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Any more questions or comments? Or? I'm just wondering how you renew yourself so that you can keep going. <coughs> Actually, um, because your job sounds so overwhelming and exhausting <laughs> to me that my brain is spinning <laughs> just, just thinking about what you have on your shoulders. I do have a really good faith community that I found in Mexico City with some friends I, where I go. Um, I also teach at the seminary over there. Um, so uh, one of my colleagues invited me to the local congregation. So I attend with their, many of the faculty of the seminary. We go there. So it's a really good faith community that allowed me to live my spirituality and be connected with God, to rest with people, to renew. To renew. But I, us I usually feel that um, every time I'm in the field with the people, is always uh, fulfilling mm -hmm. in many many ways. Like cheese when I went to, huh? <laughs> like cheese blunters. <laughs> yeah, I was like um, a few weeks ago when I was in the Dominican Republic, which is the most recent trip for for, for an example. Um, I was speaking with these women from Haiti, mm -hmm. and what and, and asking them like, what are you gonna do in this situation? And and they gave me so much hope. Mm -hmm. really? in the midst of that disaster mm -hmm. and I could see especially I've learned this in the missionary field 
If you want to understand what God loves actually looks like, mm. see the mothers. Mm. And see what the amazing and without boundary things they do to protect their children. Mm. And how actually God's love is shown to me, especially in the field through the mothers. Mm. What they're willing to sacrifice, uh, hearing their story about what they do to protect their children. It really helps me personally to understand that love, this unconditional idea of love. Mm -hmm. And actually I see it in the field every time I'm, be, I'm with the people and listening to the stories. So for mm -hmm. me, like for example, uh, listening to all that mystery, I would think to myself, but how are these people going to survive? Like how are they going to feed their children? And all of those women were so hopeful about that God will provide, they will find a solution, somebody will come and help. And I was like, no, that's not how the real world, <laughs> how the real world actually. <laughs> but, but for me, it always centered me back why we do mission. It's about the people and how they teach us. Mm. And in, my, in the case, uh, being a missionary have helped me to understand what God's love actually looks like in the field. Mm -hmm. And every time I go, actually, for me, it's renewing energies. Mm -hmm. um, the same picture I showed you about uh, Colombia and being part of that baptism mm -hmm. that, that, that they ask us to, to perform with, with my boss. So it's like those things that you are not expecting, mm -hmm. but it happened in the field mm -hmm. that we usually call God moments mm -hmm. because you never expect to have those, but they mm -hmm. always happen. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's how we, especially me. <laughs> so I don't know if you have more comments, questions, or doubts that you think I can talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if not, I will encourage you to give me your prayers, you. give my team and my colleagues in our prayers. We always need prayers. Mm -hmm. I usually share this with people like uh, United Women of Faith usually send a birthday letters to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can think that that is not significant, but when you are in the field, receive those letters are really, really Significant. Mm. So I'm always grateful with United Method. Uh, sorry, United Women of Faith today <laughs> for doing that. That people can think that is not significant, but actually it's really important for us when we're in the field and you just get this mail with this Christmas or good wishes letter. Mm -hmm. So that's a good and you can partner. The prayers are always needed, and of course your generous gifts are also welcome every time <laughs> because we need to continue to do the mission that the church is calling us to do. And in this case. All over the Latin America and the Caribbean for me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.